Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Chemical Characterization and Toxicological Risk Assessments, a Smart Approach to Biological Evaluation, sponsored by Eurofins Medical Device Testing and Tech Briefs Media Group. I'm Sherry Trigg, Editor and Director of Medical Content with Tech Briefs Media Group, and I'll be your moderator today. With extensive knowledge of the commercialization process, regulatory requirements, and scientific trends in the industry, Eurofence Medical Device Testing offers experienced GMP, GLP, and ISO 1725 testing to support the analytical chemical, microbiological, biocompatibility, electrical, mechanical, and package testing needs for all types of medical devices. The company's global network of 16 laboratories throughout North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific provide extensive capacity and the most advanced technologies and testing experience available in the industry. Our webinar will last approximately 60 minutes. In order to view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you may have on your browser. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you may submit it at any time during the presentation by entering it in the box at the left of your screen. Our presenters will answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Those questions not addressed during the live event will be answered after the webinar. In addition, a survey will pop up on everyone's screen immediately following our program. Please tell us what you thought of our webinar by answering its three short questions. Now I would like to welcome our speakers. Paolo Pecho is a technical referent for Reorphins Medical Device Testing Milan. With more than 10 years of experience performing preclinical evaluation for medical devices, Mr. Pecho's expertise lies in biological evaluation of medical devices, toxicological evaluation and risk assessment, integrated testing strategies, and ENL assessment. Matthew Woods is the principal group leader for the extractables and leachables testing team for Eurofins medical device testing. He has 11 years of chemistry experience including method development and validation and extractable and leachables testing. So now I'd like to hand the webinar over to our first speaker, Paolo Pecho. Hello, good morning to everybody and welcome to our webinar. An essential tool for the evaluation of the potential biological risk of a medical device is the ISO 1083 series of standard. ISO 1083-1 is the first part, both in publication and in reading order. Part 1 describes the framework for the biological evaluation. The current version of the standard was published in 2009, so at the moment it's a quite old standard. In US, the picture is a little bit more complicated because FDA issued two years ago its own guidance, use of the international standard ISO 1093-1, adding peculiar requirement for the US market. In any case, ISO 1093-1 describes the general principle governing the biological evaluation within a risk management process. The general categorization of devices based on the nature and the duration of their contact with the body, the evaluation of existing relevant data, the identification of gaps in available data set on the basis of a risk analysis, the identification of additional data set necessary to analyze the biological safety, and finally, the assessment of the safety of the medical device. This standard is under revision and the final draft was circulated late March this year. The voting process terminated a few days ago. It was approved, and the publication of the final document is expected during this summer. Now it's time for our first polling question. At this time, a poll question will appear on your screen. Please take a moment to answer. How familiar are you with ISO 10993 regulations and requirements, including upcoming changes? Very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not familiar? Please submit your answers now.
thank you. The results show that most of you are actually somewhat familiar. Now I will turn the presentation back over to our speaker. Okay, thank you. I try to show you some information about the new version of the standard. The entire approach was revised, and we see later on, as we see later on, but the categorization proposed is still the same, considering both type of body contact and duration. For more clarity, two additional categories are now explicit, non-contacting device as type of body contact and transitory device as duration type. Generally speaking, device falling in those categories do not require biological test, and this is for sure true for non-contacting device. Many of you are familiar with the approach set by current ISO 1083-1. In the majority of the cases, the table provided in Annex 1A is used as a checklist with all the biological effects evaluated by means of in vitro and in vivo tests. In reality, the standard says that those tests are not mandatory and that material characterization is a crucial first step of the biological evaluation. Now, with the new part one, this approach of having chemical data as a starting point is more clear, even if the table seems more complicated. Physical and or chemical information are a prerequisite information needed for a risk assessment. Description of constituent and consideration of material characterization shall precede any biological testing. Chemical characterization is described in ISO 1083-18 that is now under revision. Some new endpoints were added or at least clarified in the table. Pyrogenicity, long-term toxicity, carcinogenicity, reprotox. In any case, all the endpoints should be evaluated either through the use of existing data, specific testing, or a rationale for why the set of the endpoint does not require an additional data set. The approach to the biological evaluation is therefore changing and moving towards an evaluation based upon review of relevant available data, physical chemical characterization, and in vitro testing, with in vivo testing only being carried out to fill gaps in our understanding. All device type will require a chemical characterization as a starting point for the risk assessment. The data coming from the chemical characterization should be then toxicologically assessed to elucidate the need for further tests to address the safety of the device. In short, some biocompatibility tests like long-term toxicity, genotoxicity, and carcinogenicity could be waived thanks to the result of the chemical characterization. Therefore, as we say, the more you know, the more you save. The entire process should be planned in advance, and only a team gathering different expertise could manage this process. A team usually drafts a biological evaluation plan as a key document driving the entire evaluation. The biological evaluation plan includes arrangement for gathering information, arrangement for conducting the evaluation, including the requirements of any specific technical competences relevant to the technical device, arrangement for review and approval of the plan as a part of the overall design control process, arrangement for review of the final conclusion of the approval of any additional testing required, arrangement for the final review and approval of the outcomes of the biological risk assessment, including the risk control measures. As mentioned before, the biological evaluation starts with the chemical characterization of the device. Therefore, it's time to pass over to Matthew. 
Thank you, Paolo. Paolo has established that chemically characterizing a device is the starting point for assessing biocompatibility. These two statements from different parts of ISO 10993 reinforce that, chemically characterize, that chemical characterization provides the framework to gather information and perform testing. Chemical characterization not only minimizes the need for animal testing, but sets the sponsor up for success to assess biocompatibility in a scientifically sound and cost-efficient manner. In order to chemically characterize the device, the current version of ISO 10993 Part 18, as well as the draft version, both provide flowcharts to summarize each step of the process. My discussion on chemical characterization will follow the step-by-step -step process in Part 18 from start until the toxicological evaluation. At that point, Paolo will again take over and discuss performing the tox evaluation on the information generated from the chemical characterization assessment. The first step in the chemical characterization process is essentially a fact-finding and information-gathering process. In order to properly chemically characterize the device, the sponsor must have an understanding of how the device is made, how it will be used, and what potential gaps there are in the sponsor's understanding of the device. After establishing an understanding of the device, the next steps are a framework on how to use the information obtained to appropriately chemically characterize the device. Initially, a comparison should be made to a predicate device. Next, the worst case chemical release should be evaluated. Finally, an effective extractables and leachables evaluation of the device should be performed. Again, the first step in the risk assessment is establishing the configuration, composition, and clinical use of the device. First, let's establish what types of devices can be appropriately assessed using chemical characterization. Primarily, chemical characterization is used for class two and class three medical devices since they pose an elevated risk to the user or patient. If the device does not have any direct or indirect tissue contacting components, typically no biocompatibility information would need to be generated. After establishing that the device has direct or indirect contact, there is a plethora of information to gather. A sponsor needs to establish the materials of construction and gather as much information on the composition of these materials as possible. If this information is not readily available, sponsors can use qualitative and quantitative methods to determine the composition of the materials, filling gaps where there is incomplete information. The process of transforming the materials of construction into the device should also be evaluated. Additives or residuals from this process will need to be considered, as well as an understanding of the resulting composition of the materials after they have been processed. The anatomical location is important information, as well as other details pertaining, pertaining to clinical use, like duration of use, dosing, and intended use population. Finally, an applicable predicate device can be extremely useful during the chemical characterization process. If there is a potential predicate device, the same information on the predicate device pertaining to the composition and clinical use of the device should be obtained. All of the information obtained for the chemical characterization allows the sponsor to determine the appropriate endpoints for their biocompatibility risk assessment. As Paolo discussed earlier, the sponsor will use the information on the device to evaluate what additional endpoints should be considered from ISO 10993, like cytotoxicity or sensitization. Depending on the purpose of the device, ISO standards other than 10993 should also be considered. For example, a fairly new ISO standard is 18562. The Eurofins Medical Device Group has recently developed the capabilities to evaluate a device using this new standard, the purpose of which is to address the gas pathways of medical devices. 
A sponsor should exhaust all resources to try to gather and leverage available information as much as possible. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. Vendors should be able to provide appropriate compositional information. Sponsors should use established components and materials when possible, since the information on those components should be readily available and easily obtained. Qualitative and quantitative analyses to determine the composition of the materials mentioned in the previous slide should be the last option after exhausting all other avenues for information. After establishing the device, the first step or option in the chemical characterization process is a comparison to a predicate device. An appropriate predicate device is a device that has been approved and established to be safe for use. Equivalence between the new device and the predicate device is demonstrated through a comparison of the information that has already been gathered during the first step of, chemical of the first step of the chemical characterization process. The purpose of this comparison is to determine if the safety risk of the new device is the same or less than the approved and established device. An example of this could occur when the only difference between a new device and an established predicate device is that the new device will be introduced to the patient in a manner that lessens the patient risk. Since the predicate device has been established as more invasive and a higher risk to the patient, the chemical equivalence of the new device is met. If a sponsor can demonstrate that the material and risk for the new device is equivalent or less than the approved device, the chemical characterization is complete. That's why an emphasis should be put on using established materials and seeking out predicate devices. Obviously, not all comparisons are as simple as the example I just provided, and one avenue to explore to aid in comparison is the extractables profile. If a sponsor can demonstrate that the extractables profile of the new device is equivalent to the predicate device, this can go a long way in establishing chemical equivalence. I will discuss this extractables profile comparison when I address extractables and leachables later in the presentation. If a sponsor cannot establish that their device has an equivalent or less than equivalent safety risk than, the, than an established device, the next approach the standard directs a sponsor to consider is a worst case chemical release. The basis of the worst case chemical release is evaluating the impact if the entire device transferred to the patient during use. The first step in performing this evaluation is determining the appropriate safety threshold. The safety threshold is based on the, toxic, the threshold of toxicological concern as well as the patient contacting and dosing information. I will describe how to, de how to determine a safety threshold in more detail when I discuss extractables and leachables valuation. After establishing the safety threshold, the sponsor should then perform an assessment comparing the qualitative and quantitative information on the composition of all of the materials of the device including the processing materials, against the safety threshold. If the sponsor can demonstrate that even when all constituents of the device are introduced to the patient, there is no safety concern for the patient, then the chemical characterization process is complete. However, if the sponsor is not able to establish that the entire composition of the device is acceptable to the patient, the sponsor should move to the next step of the process, which is an extractables and leachables evaluation. Before I describe how to design and perform an appropriate extractables and leachables study, I'd like to briefly touch on what extractables and leachables are and where they typically come from. Extractables are compounds that can be released from a device under conditions that are at least as aggressive as typical use. Leachables are compounds released from a device during actual clinical use. Because the conditions used to generate extractables are harsher than clinical use, typically leachables are a subset of extractables. Both extractables and leachables are all-encompassing terms to describe many different compounds from many different potential sources with many potential different risk factors. 
Evaluating the potential extractable or leachable compounds is the final endpoint for chemically characterizing a device. When a sponsor designs a study to evaluate potential extractables and or leachables from a device, there are many options, therefore many decisions that need to be made. The information gathering and risk assessment performed during the first step of the chemical characterization process will go a long way to aid the sponsor in making those decisions. Most of the information pertaining to sample preparation is currently detailed in ISO 10993 Part 12. The proposed revision of Part 18 contains conditions relevant to only an extractables or leachables valuation, whereas the current Part 12 contains information on how to perform testing for a variety of endpoints. First, a sponsor will need to determine if the entire device can be evaluated. The standard does state that the use of the whole device is preferred. However, there are situations in which it is not possible to evaluate the entire device. If a decision is made to evaluate components of the device separately, the standard recommends evaluating the materials proportionally in the test sample. If there are joints or seals, those need to be included in the evaluation since these areas tend to be a higher risk for potential leachables. Another key point to make is the material should be tested as they would be used, meaning if the device is sterilized before use, it should be sterilized as part of the sample preparation. The next consideration for the sponsor are the extraction conditions. The standard provides three different starting points for the extraction conditions the clinical use of the device, and its inherent risk to the patient determine which of the extraction conditions should be used. It is important to pick appropriate conditions to adequately assess the device without altering the device. Devices with long-term patient contact, like an implantable, should be evaluated using an exhaustive extraction. An exhaustive extraction is performed in series and is carried out until the last extraction is less than 10% gravimetrically of the initial extraction. This provides data to show that the extraction conditions have been rigorous enough to pull all potential extractables. Exaggerated extractions expose the device to conditions at least as and typically harsher than clinical use. The standard provides the four different conditions listed and also states that other conditions can be used provided that the sponsor provides justification. Important to note, the FDA does not consider 37C to be exaggerated, and there should be justification if this condition is used. Both exhaustive and exaggerated conditions provide a worst-case extractables profile. Exposing the medical device to worst-case clinical use conditions is the final possibility, which is considered a simulation or leachable study. Typically, a simulation study or leachable study is performed when the composition of the device does not allow for exaggerated conditions or it is performed in conjunction with or after an exaggerated study based on the assessment of the exaggerated study. Another consideration for the, the design of an extractables and leachable study is solvent choice. The standard recommends using both polar and nonpolar solvents. However, the examples provided in the current standard are not applicable to typical analytical methods used. For example, extracting in cottonseed oil is not appropriate for a GCMS or LCMS screening analysis. The Eurofins medical device team typically recommends water, ethanol, and hexenes to cover a variety of polarities. The proposed revision of Part 18 agrees with this recommendation. Again, it is important to note that solvents which compromise the integrity of the device should not be used. For example, if hexanes causes the device to swell during extraction, then it is not an appropriate extraction solvent. The surface area to volume ratio can also have an effect on the extraction process. This table is pulled straight from Part 12, 
and it provides an outline of appropriate surface area or weight to volume ratios dependent on the type of device or material. Achieving these surface area to volume ratios can sometimes be challenging. Materials can be cut or crushed so that these ratios are met. However, when evaluating any type of coated material or material that might have surface properties different from the bulk material, cutting or crushing the material should be avoided. After the extraction is complete, the next step is evaluating the extracts generated. A variety of techniques should be used so that extractables big to small and volatile to non-volatile can all be detected. This slide provides a framework for the different techniques that the Eurofins medical device team typically recommends based on the extraction and device to provide a complete extractables profile. High performance or ultra performance liquid chromatography mass spectrometry with a photodiode array detector to evaluate non volatile organics, gas chromatography mass spectrometry with a direct inject sample introduction to evaluate semi volatile organics, gas chromatography mass spectrometry with headspace sample introduction to evaluate volatile organics, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry or optical emission spectrometry to evaluate inorganic impurities, as well as ion chromatography or indirect UV to evaluate anions. The data generated from the analyses must be scrutinized. Efforts should be focused on providing as much information as possible on each of the extractable compounds generated. For example, the Eurofins medical device team has proprietary databases which combines commercially available databases like the NIST GCMS database with our own information from performing countless studies and evaluating numerous compounds found in commonly used polymers and elastomers. One unique instance in which identification of peaks may not be necessary or important is when making a comparison to a predicate device. As I mentioned earlier, chemical equivalents can be determined through the comparison of the extractables profile between a predicate device and new device. The sponsor can perform the same appropriate extraction on both devices and make a comparison between the extraction profiles. If the profile of the new device is less extensive or the same as the established device, then the chemical characterization is complete. However, any extractable present in the new device at a higher concentration than the predicate or any extractable that is not present in the predicate needs to be evaluated. The last consideration to make in the design of the study is the safety threshold for the device. The threshold of toxicological concern is the level in which any chemical will not pose a significant risk. The clinical use of the device will determine the TTC value. Paolo will go into much more detail on how the toxicological assessment is performed, but it is important for the sponsor to understand the TTC so that, so that they can ensure that the reporting limits in the analytical techniques used are appropriate. The AET is the analytical evaluation threshold. The AET value is calculated by using the TTC as well as the dosing information of the product. Essentially, this calculation provides a concentration cutoff value to be used during the data analysis and interpretation. Compounds with a concentration below the AET are as assessed as being safe, even without identification. Compounds above the AET need to be identified and toxicologically assessed. This slide provides an example of calculating the AET of a transdermal patch using a TTC of 1.5 micrograms per day with building in an uncertainty factor of 50%. Finally, it is extremely important to determine the AET before proceeding with the extractables and leachables evaluation. There is nothing that can be done to lower limits after extracts have been generated and evaluated. After performing the extractables and leachables evaluation, 
The next step is to perform a toxicological evaluation. And I'll turn it back over to Paolo to discuss how, this, how to perform this evaluation. But first, we have a second polling question pertaining to the toxicological evaluation. At this time, another poll question will appear on your screen. Please take a moment to answer. How familiar are you with toxicological evaluation of extracted and leached substances? Very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not familiar? Please submit your answers now. Thank you. The results show that most of you are somewhat familiar. Now I will turn the presentation back over to Paolo. Thank you. So I try to give you an overview of the toxicological evaluation. As mentioned by Matthew, the data coming from the chemical characterization should be toxicologically evaluated. Before going ahead with the actual toxicological evaluation, I would like to remember you a couple of definitions. Tolerable exposure is the daily amount of a compound that a human can tolerate without a risk for his safety. Threshold of toxicological concern, TTC, is a human exposure threshold value associated with no risk to human health. TTC is a de facto a tolerable exposure. The tolerable exposure is compared with the maximum daily intake for each extracted or leached compound. The margin of safety is then defined as the ratio between those two values. In case the margin of safety is above one, there is little likelihood for adverse systemic effects to occur. We are on the safe side. In case the margin of safety is below one, the likelihood for adverse systemic effect is increased. The question is how we derive tolerable exposure for the extracted or leached compounds found during the chemical characterization. Practically speaking, we have three different cases. The first one, where the compound is known and there are relevant toxicological data available. The second case is where those tox data are not available. The third case is where the compound is unknown and therefore no tox data are available. In the first case, a full evaluation is possible and we can determine an actual tolerable exposure based on the toxicological value found in literature. In the second case, due to the lack of relevant data, an in silico evaluation could be performed to predict the toxicological behavior of the compound under evaluation and then derive a tolerable exposure. In the third case, we should apply only TTC concept because no information related to the compounds are available. At the end of the toxicological evaluation, as mentioned before, we should be able to evaluate the actual likelihood for adverse systemic effects to occur during the clinical use of the device. In case we still have gaps in our knowledge of the biological risk, we are requested to perform some additional tests. We should refer to the several parts of the ISO 1083 series. You will find a relevant standard for each endpoint that need to be addressed. For example, cytotoxicity is described in part five, irritation in part 10, systemic toxicity in part 11, and so on. By the way, a lot of those standards are now under revision. When everything is completed, you should have collected a lot of documents. Your documentation for a bad compatibility evaluation should at least include a general description of the device, including packaging, information on constituents, including physical characteristics, description of the manufacturing process, a review of available toxicity and prior use data, test report, a final assessment on the data, and a statement confirming that the risk analysis and the risk control have been completed, 
and hopefully confirming that your device is safe. Now, I would like to share with you a couple of case studies. The first one is showing the approach to a complete biological evaluation for a new device composed of four different parts. The device is intended for orthopedic surgery and it's made of peak, titanium alloy, and polyethylene, very well-known materials. The different parts have a different categorization according to ISO 1093-1. Part A, B, and C are the actual implanted parts, therefore are classified as implant in permanent contact with bone tissue, while Part D is used only as a tool during the surgical procedure. Therefore, it's categorized as externally communicating device in limited contact, few hours, with bone tissue. So the endpoints to be evaluated are different. The main sources of biological risk are the raw materials and the manufacturing process. As you know, the manufacturing process should be designed to reduce as much as possible the amount of residues. The proposed approach is summarized here. First step, biological evaluation plan describing the proposed strategy. The second step is the risk analysis of raw material, including packaging based on literature research. Next is the risk analysis of the manufacturing process, investigating each manufacturing step. Then, the evaluation of the cleaning procedure that leads to cleaning validation. The fifth step is the main extractable study, using three solvent and 50 degrees as extraction temperature, as requested by FDA guideline. The extracted compounds are later on toxicologically assessed, and in case of no relevant concern, only few biological tests are performed, focusing only on acute effects. With everything completed, the biological evaluation report is issued, and at the end, the device can be considered to be safe for its intended use. The second example is related to change management, where a smart approach helped to reduce the number of tests required for the biological evaluation, saving time and money. The device is a transfemoral catheter system composed of an handle and an actual catheter. The change is related to the different material for wire in the expander unit of the catheter. The new material is ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, and for this material, there is a, lot, there is a direct contact with the blood for a limited time. The surface area of the specific component in contact with blood is smaller for the new material compared with the old one. We started looking at the composition of the material, and from safety data sheet, it was confirmed that it is 100% polyethylene. As for the previous example, a biological research about toxicological profile of the raw material polyethylene was performed using ToxNet as a starting point. But we have also used other sources dealing with more specific application of the polyethylene in medical device. And you find here some examples. The polyethylene is, as anticipated, a well-known material for biomedical application with a wide range of use from orthopedic device, such as artificial joint, to vascular prosthesis. Beside the literature, a lot of biocompatibility data were already available. We got data about extractable profile, in vitro and in vivo tests performed on the raw material. In short, we had a broad spectrum of evidence. Therefore, there was no biocompatibility concern related to the use of this material. But what? What about manufacturing and sterilization process of the actual finished catheter? Our strategy 
address this question. On the basis of the considerations summarized here, the fact that raw material is biocompatible, less than 0.1% of the device surface made with the new material is in contact with blood, and in any case, the contact is limited, and routine tests, such as by burden determination and endotoxin tests are performed on the finished device, the test strategy was limited to cytotoxicity test and hemolysis test. Compared to the checklist approach, this strategy reduces the number of tests required, saving time and money. This strategy was accepted by the competent authority. To summarize what we have discussed today, chemical characterization will be a starting point for the biological evaluation of a medical device, as described in a coming revision of ISO 1093-1. Several techniques are applicable to chemical analysis of leachable compounds. Toxicological evaluation is a powerful tool to determine the concern posed by leachable substances. In vitro and in vitro tests are performed only to fill gaps in our, in our knowledge of the biological risk. So thanks to everybody for being with us today. And now it's time for questions and answers. Thank you, Paolo and Matt. Now we would like to begin our Q&A. Remember, if you have a question, you may submit it by entering it in the box at the left of your screen. Our first question is for Paolo. Uh, when should we expect the revision of ISO 10993, 18, and 17? Oh, good question. Both standards are now under revision. And uh, as you can imagine, there are a lot of discussion around them. Uh, the working group involved in those standards had a, an interim meeting in April this year. And uh, we have a next meeting planned uh, for December this year. A, a draft uh, in DIS, so a draft of international standard, for part 18 is expected before mm, the next meeting. And uh, then um, the idea is to address all the comments during the, um, the meeting in December. For part 17, we are still drafting a, a committee draft. But in short, in the best case, we have to wait at least one year and a half, two years, to have this new standard in place. Thank you. Um, our next question, actually, for both of you, you mentioned gas gas pathways device. How should we approach the biocompatibility of this kind of device? OK, <laughs> let me start. So uh, the ISO 1093 series, as you know, is intended to cover the biological evaluation of medical device. However, gas pathway device pose peculiar risk. And the ISO 1093 series does not address the biological evaluation of those devices in a specific way. So as mentioned by Matthew, we should refer to ISO 18.562 series to evaluate the biocompatibility of gas pathway device. The ISO 18.562-1 uh, covers the general principle regarding biocompatibility tests. Then we have other three parts, part two, part three, and part four, cover specific tests, and I think that Matthew could add something on, on that. Right. Thanks, Paolo. Yeah, I, I can definitely give a, a, a brief uh, overview on, on the testing in those, in those uh, parts. So part two is a test for particulate matter. Um, typically, to perform this, or as the, as the um, standard suggests, is what you want to do is you want to flow air or a specific gas, whatever is used for this device, through the device, and then either through a filter or through a particle counter. Um, and the test is, again, for particulate matter. So there, you're either going to be doing a weight difference with the filters or conversions from the particle counter to determine um, your particulate matter for that part. 
Part three is a test for emissions of volatile organic compounds. Similar setup to part two, where you want to flow air through the device. At this time, or for this test, actually, you want to collect the gas. Uh, this is um, a bit of a tricky part to it. You, you either want to use um, canisters or thermal desorption tubes. Um, the standard then discuss how you need to perform a volatiles analysis, and it recommends using um, ISO standard 16,000 part six or an, an equivalent method there to, to evaluate for volatiles. The last part, part four, is a standard to test the leachables and condensate. To perform this evaluation, you do an extraction on the interior surface of the gas pathway. Uh, then you do GCMS, LCMS testing for organic impurities. Uh, you do inorganic or metal ion contact or inorganic um, impurities by USP223. Uh, important to note there that it, the standard does specifically say that if you do uh, ISO 10993 part one, if, if that's been completed, that chemical characterization, or if you've gone through uh, part one, then um, the part four of this device, of this chapter or this standard does not need to be performed since you've already gone through the, either the extractables and leachables evaluation or other evaluations that you do not need to perform extractables and leachables evaluation. So that's um, a, a quick summary of, of the three parts of that standard where, there, where testing is required. Thank you both for those uh, detailed answers. Uh, our next question, Paolo, how can I waive the big three, cytotoxicity, irritation, and sensitization tests? Okay. Very, very good question. We have a, a lot of discussion about uh, about, the, about uh, this question. Generally speaking, systemic efforts, uh, reprotoxicity, genotoxicity, and carcinogenicity can often be addressed using uh, chemical characterization and the risk assessment approach, as we have seen today. While some local efforts uh, or acute efforts, uh, such as cytotoxicity, irritation, sensitization, might not be adequately addressed using this approach. And uh, I have to be very honest, and it's quite tricky way with those uh, big three tests using only literature and extractable and leachable data. But, uh, of course, we have some parameters that could, that could help. Mm, let me say, starting from the very basic things, pH, uh, in case of very low pH or very high pH, the device, the device uh, is considered to be irritant and therefore cytotoxic, so there is no need to, to perform this, uh, this test. But on the other hand, cytotoxicity is a quick test and it's quite cheap, and uh, sometimes you spend more trying to, to waive this test rather than performing an actual uh, test. But in any case, you should be prepared to handle positive, uh, positive results for this test. For irritation and sensitization, the picture is more complicated and related to the physical nature of the device. It could be a liquid, a solid, a cream. They pose peculiar um, issues. And uh, you should also consider the contact time and the nature of body contact. Anyway, mm, combining some uh, in silico method, the specific threshold, in some cases, is possible to evaluate those endpoints from extractable and leachable, uh, leachable data. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, for Matt. Are ENL tests required for all types of devices? Thank you. Uh, there's, there's definitely devices out there that are not appropriate for uh, chemical characterization. Um, there was a slide in my, pre in my part of the presentation that talked about the different classes of medical devices and how typically only um, class two and class three devices are um, applicable for chemical characterization. Really, the, the risk assessment is the big factor here. Um, so devices that have really short duration or there's really low risk factor, example would be a wheelchair or a crutch, um, 
even though these are classified as medical devices, these are not um, these will not be uh, a chemical characterization of these devices would not be necessary. There's other some there's also some tricky devices um, that are are tr tricky devices or materials that are classified as as a chem as a device that are tricky for chemical characterization. An example would be um, a, a topical or um, liquid for a, a contact lens, things like this where performing chemical characterization, it, it's not really applicable, it doesn't really fall, or um, performing an extraction on that is, is not really possible or, or really good science. Um, so there, um, a, a list of the constituents of the device would, all, would be all that's necessary for this portion of the testing. Great, thank you so much. Our next question, uh, perhaps for both of you, if I have unknowns for identifications, what can be done? Matthew, you go first? Sure, I'll go first on this one. Um, so in terms of analytical work and trying to um, gain, gain better information, obviously, um, the, I provided a, a, a slide in which our typical um, techniques are performed, screening analysis, where we're really trying to get an idea of everything possible that could potentially come out of, of the materials in these extracts. So the first thing that, that could be evaluated is um, modifying these methods. So if you have an unknown that pops up in a, in a GCMS analysis, um, Possibly modifying that method somehow could give you a better spectra, um, or um, provide and, and or provide you with some information to to try to provide a, a toxicologist like Paolo with with more information to um, better to perform a better tox assessment. Other instrumentation is also available out there. Um, we we use a QTOF and an Orby trap. Um, here in the Eurofins medical device team a lot to perform um, structural elucidation and, and be able to provide uh, Palo with, with more information on a, on a potential unknown compound. There's the other thing that you, that, that um, a lot of, that we find a lot of times is when we're performing these extractions on medical devices, we're looking at multiple um, different plastics, elastomers, all contained in one extraction. So if there is an unknown, it's difficult to try to isolate where that unknown could be coming from. So if there is an unknown that could, that's um, potentially problematic, a lot of times what we do is we try to source that unknown, figure out where, what material that unknown is coming from, and then, um, with the information from the manufacturer on that material, how it's used and, and possible additives. Um, a lot of times that then provides us with the information of where this unknown is coming from and, and allows us to, to give a, a tentative identification for that. So really in terms of analytically of, of how to deal with unknowns, it's, it's really important to, to talk to uh, experts like ourselves on this and, and really develop a plan based based on the unknown and, and whatever potential information you have on, on your material. Um, and I guess I'll turn it over to Paolo now to talk about um, his, his assessment uh, when there are unknowns. Oh, okay. Well, in terms of toxicological evaluation, uh, in case of later on, uh, after performing additional uh, um, chemical evaluation, we have an uh, and an identification of this of this compound, we can perform a full toxicological evaluation and um, determine a tolerable exposure using existing data or maybe using in silico in silico prediction. In case there are still unknown, uh, as mentioned, in a worst case approach, we should treat uh, the unknown as a genotoxic and use the TTC value. Uh, maybe that most of you are familiar with the 1.5 microgram per day, that is the lowest TTC value uh, that you can find in literature for um, genotoxic impurities. 
and it's applicable uh, for uh, long-term exposure also to medical device. But uh, for medical uh, for medical device that have an exposure mm -hmm. that is uh, lower than the entire life, we can increase this uh, this value, and we can also apply the um, 120 micrograms per day um, TTC value for a device that are in contact with less than one month, just for a few days and so on. Thank you both. Uh, our next question also uh, for both of you, how can we perform a chemical characterization when there is a potential of product anticipated degra degradation cross-linked hyaluronic acid gel in the extraction vehicle? Well, uh, the, in case of a uh, product like, uh, like, this, uh, like this one, the, um, so it's a, it's a gel uh, or it's a hydrogel containing it usually in a glass syringe, our, our approach uh, is to uh, evaluate the two things in a separate way. I mean the packaging, the primary packaging that is uh, the glass syringe and uh, the, the device that is the, the hydrogel. So uh, the extractable study using solvent uh, is performed on, on the syringe and uh, we apply, uh, we use different, uh, different solvent and uh, usually an extraction at, uh, at 50 degrees for 72 hours in order to have uh, the profile of extractable coming from the syringe. While the gel included in the um, in the syringe is uh, is evaluated as a chemical characterization, more uh, on the basis of um, of raw material and of um, on the basis of identification and uh, determination of the single uh, uh, of the single constituent of the medical uh, device. So. Uh, the chemical determination of a hyaluronic acid and other components in the in the syringe. Um, so this approach doesn't require to use a specific a solvent to uh, for for the extraction of the of the, of the device, and this prevents uh, the degradation of the product because uh, our aim is to to evaluate the biological safety of the fi finished device at is, a, is on the clean, for its clinical use. And what we should avoid in, in any case is a degradation of the, of the device during the extraction because uh, we, uh, at the end, we evaluate the degradation products that are not extractable or, or leachable. And, and um, I, I believe you said that question was for both of us, but I thought um, I, don't, I do not have anything to add to, to Paolo's response there. Great. Thank you so very much. Um, actually, at this time, we have uh, reached the end of today's webinar. Again, if we did not get a chance to answer your question, our sponsors will do their best to address them after today's presentation. Our thanks to Paolo Pecho, Matthew Woods, and everyone for joining us today. Please take a moment to answer the three survey questions before you go. This, the slides for this webinar are not available for download, but the webinar will be available on demand at techbrief.com for the next 12 months. Have a great day, everyone.